Thank you very much. Thank you. It, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I want to talk about, this talk is actually not a technical talk. I'm not going to talk a lot about functional programming or about reactive programming. This talk is actually about my journey. And I want to talk about my journey in learning about reactive programming and what it meant to me. Uh, first of all, I'll start by saying that as programmers, we learn languages, we learn syntax, we learn libraries, but the most difficult thing for us to really do is to learn about paradigms. Paradigm shift is incredibly difficult. The reason paradigm shift is really hard is when it comes to paradigm shift, we have to change the way we think, change the way we behave, change the way we code. It fundamentally changes every part of what we do when, when we go through paradigm shift. And I'm going to say, in my experience, I've been programming for uh, 30 plus years now, and I'll say that the most difficult part of my career has been when I got, went through paradigm shifts. And I think I've gone through maybe about six different paradigm shifts all through my career. The very first paradigm shift for me was, first of all, to learn to program in the first place. That was really hard because I learned to program when I had no access to computers. So I actually used to write code on paper, and my compilers were actually fellow human beings. Because I didn't have access to computers, they would read my code and tell me you know, if I'm in the right direction. I actually spent more time learning algorithm than coding in the first place because obviously you can draw pictures of algorithms and talk about how you'll solve a problem without actually having a computer to a certain extent. My second paradigm shift was really learning to program object-oriented. Uh, some of you may be surprised about it because I started actually programming before object-oriented programming became mainstream. And, and learning to program with object-oriented programming, polymorphism, that was really hard for me. My third paradigm shift was trying to learn to understand to program with COM and CORBA. The only thing I ever wish these days is my chi children will never find out that I once did CORBA. This is really scary, right? What if they ever discover, it's like, Dad, what did you do for a living back then? So, you know, if somebody comes to me and talks about Object Factory one more time, I'll strangle them. That's how angry I am when I think about it. The reason is not because it didn't work. The problem is it worked and I had no clue why it worked. And I had to really dig in. I actually wrote COM programming in C before I understood how it worked before I started using the libraries. My fourth paradigm shift was really learning about asynchronous programming. I've come from decades of programming in languages like C++ and Java, and for me to start programming using Node and JavaScript was really hard because I had to think about asynchrony and what it means to program asynchronously. My fifth paradigm shift was functional programming. What made it really worse is everybody told me how cool it is and how easy it is. Like, no, it's really hard because it, I've got to think very differently. Rather than thinking imperatively, I had to think about transformations and solving problems in, in, as a way of transforming uh, data. My sixth paradigm shift was about reactive programming, and that's the last two paradigm shifts I'm going to talk about today, what it meant to really learn functional programming and what did it mean to learn reactive programming. Let's talk a little bit about functional programming just for a few minutes. What does it really mean to program functionally? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Let's start with a little example here. Let's say we have a collection of people on our hand. So here is a function that returns to us a collection of people. Let's say for now, I want to find the first person who is older than 30 years and I want their name. So how would you do this in the imperative style of programming? Imperative style is where you tell uh, what to do uh, and also you also uh, spend a lot of time telling how to do it as well. So this is a very low level programming. We've been doing this for a very long time. As an industry, we all have been doing imperative style of programming. So what would you do? I want the name, of course, name of the first person older than 30. So what is the very first thing you're going to say? String name equal to, and what do you set this to? You're going to say null. How do you feel 
right there, right? It, it feels really bad, isn't it? Because null is a smell. Everything now goes downhill from now on, right? This is, this is not gonna get any better. Then you say for string, and then take a uh, you know, person after all, and then this is gonna come from the create people function, and then what do you do? You say if the person dot get age is greater than 30, then what am I gonna do? Great, I'm gonna now say name is equal to person dot get name, and then, of course, once I get the name, I'm going to go back over here. And then I'm going to do this beautiful if name is not equal to null. This only keeps on giving, isn't it? And then you output saying the name is the name we have. Otherwise, you say else, we will say output maybe name not found. Well, if you look at this code, you immediately point out I'm wrong because I'm missing something very critical. And that is I have to put a break on this. If I don't put a break, in the best case, I get a slow response. In the worst case, I get a wrong response. In both ways, we are in trouble. Well, when you write a code like this, of course, what you do is you then run the code and see if it works. It didn't. So in this case, of course, I want to take a person object that's been given to us. That's going to be a, a person, not a string after all. So we'll make it a person. So we'll say this is a person object. I'm going to ask for all the people in the collection. It says Paula is the response. Now look at this code for a second. Has anyone here written code like this before? Of course, those who raise the hand admitted to it. Those who didn't raise the hand, I fully understand. You don't want to raise your hand in public to that question. <laughs> but more important question to ask is, how do you feel when you write a code like this? I'll tell you how you deeply feel. You feel dirty. Because when you go home, the children come running towards you, you say, don't touch me, I got to take a shower first before I come into the house. That's how you feel about code like this, right? It's a very low level programming that we have to write. Well, on the other hand, what we could really do about this is, rather than spending so much time and effort to implement this code, we could try this one more time. We could simply say create people dot stream, where stream is the internal iterator. I say filter given a person, person dot get age, and in this case, age is greater than 30. Perform a map operation. In this case, I say given a person, get me the name of the person. Then I say find the first, and then once I find the first person, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna say in this case, or else, maybe no one found. And then once I find the solution, I can output that solution right here and execute the code. Notice how much easier it really was to execute the code, and that is a functional style of programming, but more important is declarative in nature. So in the declarative style of programming, which is also functional, well, actually, sorry, which is functional. So declarative style, what's the difference? I'm going to say functional style is actually declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. So if you notice over here, the functions like filter and map are higher order functions because we are passing functions to other functions, but they are inherently declarative, where declarative is where we tell what to do and more important, not how to do it. So this becomes a lot more easier to communicate our intent. The code becomes a lot easier. But one of the most charming capabilities of functional programming, when people talk about functional programming, what do they normally talk about? Well, a lot of times, me included, when we talk about functional programming, we talk about things like immutability. And then we talk about higher order functions. And unfortunately, though, that is missing a lot of point, in my opinion, because these are means to a, a greater end. So these things that you saw up here are means to a greater end. What we really are after is not immutability or higher order functions. It's something else a lot more fundamental. And one of them is functional composition. Functional composition is incredibly powerful. If you notice over here, notice how these calls are composed of method calls. We take all the people, we get only people who are older than 30, then we get their name, but we get the first one and we are done. Now when you look at this code, you say, hey, that's awesome, this code is very expressive. The code begins to read like the problem statement. You can just walk through the code in a single pass and you can see what the code is doing. It becomes really easy to understand. The code is very expressive. Well, while the code is very expressive, that is also, we can say, the code is cute. 
But I've come to this very important conclusion about cuteness in my life. And cuteness is not sustainable. This is very sad fact. Look at a baby when the baby is born. What do people say? How cute. And this is sad because when the baby is so cute, this cuteness lasts for exactly two years. The minute the baby starts talking, nobody likes the baby anymore. You're talking too much, be quiet. And the baby becomes annoying and then grows into an adult being annoying forever. So when I meet small children, I always deliver them the bad news. I tell the baby, everybody will tell you you're cute, but I want you to know that's not going to sustain, right? The point really is cuteness doesn't sustain. What we really want is performance, right? So performance counts. So performance is extremely important. Performance, after all, counts. Now think about this for a minute. If I give you a collection of all the names, you work really hard to find everyone who's older than 30. Then you get their name. And then you come to me and say, I worked all night, and I got all the information for you. I smile at you and say, thanks. And I take the very first one and throw everything else after that. How would you feel about it? Not very good, isn't it? Because it's a lot of wasted effort, wasted work. Why do you want to really waste that much effort doing things after all? So it turns out there's something incredibly important, and that is lazy evaluation. So lazy evaluation, so it, it is to me functional programming. So really, functional programming uh, is really about realizing two things, functional composition and lazy evaluation. Well, what I mean by lazy evaluation is the following. When I run this code, notice it said Paula. But if you look at the collection, we got Sarah, Sarah, Bob, Paula, but then we have Paul, Jack, Jack, and Jill. If I go to the person class right now, and in the person I output, let's say get age four, and I say plus, and I'm gonna put the name right here. Now when I go back and execute this code, notice it never touched anyone after Paula. That's because of laziness right there. Laziness is extremely important. Let's think about laziness in ways we can really understand. Remember the time when you were in school. There were two kinds of students in school. Those who studied every single day. I never understood those people. And then students like me, who promptly studied the night before the exam. And they would say, Venkat, you have to study every day because there's an exam. I would tell them, but that's four months away. On the exam day, there could be a storm. On the exam day, the teacher may die. There are so many things that could go wrong. Why would you want to waste your time studying all this time, isn't it? So what do you do? You're absolutely going to wait until the exam, make sure it's going to happen, then minimally study for it. What is that called? Being smart, isn't it? Well, that's exactly the whole point is don't do any work other than what you have absolutely have to do. Well, that's exactly what you're seeing here is lazy really is important because lazy evaluation equal to efficiency and performance after all, and that's what we're really after. So the lesson I learned from functional programming is not about immutability, not about higher order functions. It is about thinking about problem solving in terms of lazy evaluations and functional composition. Then I started looking at reactive programming, and the very first thing I asked myself was, what in the world is reactive programming? That's the first question I want to know the answer for, what is reactive programming? So we talked about function composition and lazy evaluation, but I want to quickly say one more thing before we go any forward, and that is efficiency is attained not by doing things faster, but by avoiding things that shouldn't be done in the first place. I, I live in a bear country. We always worry about what if you're on a hike and a bear will be in front of you. And then people told me, you don't have to worry so much about it. Because they told me, when you see a bear, you don't have to run very fast. You only have to run faster than the person behind you. And this is a really good advice, isn't it? So that is exactly what this is. You don't have to be the fastest. You just have to be fast enough. And efficiency really counts in that context. That's what you really are after. So I want to talk about reactive programming, and I'll come back and connect to this. So what is reactive programming? 
When I started looking at reactive programming, I was like, wow, why do we need yet another programming model? I felt like just now I caught up with the world, and now they talk about a new programming model. Then I realized that we work in a field where every 10 years, we'll give a new name for what we already do and get really excited about it. So reactive programming is not new at all. It's been around for a very long time. Eric Meyer coined this term as part of his Microsoft research, but this idea has been around even before he give, the, give this a term. And what is it really? It is a model where an application responds to stimuli. Why do we need this? If you really think about it, there's a lot of things that have changed in the last 10 years or so. Some of you may remember physically walking into a bank. That's a long time ago, isn't it? Some of you may have walked into a travel agency to get a travel ticket. Who has gone to a travel agency recently? Not a, oh, okay, a few of us still hanging in there dearly, but not a whole lot of us, isn't it? So the point really is, we don't usually use the services, why? Because in the past, companies made applications for their employees to use and made their employees available to us, the customer. When employees use an application, those employees, they have a special name. They're called captive users, meaning no one cares what they think. On the other hand, now companies make software available to real world users. If an application doesn't work properly, you're moving away to use something else, you're not stuck with the applications. So the applications have to be really much better today. Secondly, today we live in a world of digital computing. We are walking with multiple devices. I'm almost nostalgic when I say this to you. I remember the days I would wake up in the morning and when my coffee pot is brewing coffee, my modem will connect and it'll reconnect. I can hear the whoosh the modem would make. And I would call my friends and ask them, what's the baud rate you are getting today? Today we are carrying multiple internet enabled devices with us. Every one of us, I'm not even talking about watches anymore. I'm talking about earrings, nose rings, and tongue rings, all internet enabled, constantly transmitting data about us. The, uh, the biggest geek I know is my son. The other day I patted him and several devices fell off him. I don't even know how many he is carrying with him. So in that regard, when you're building applications for this day and age, it's important the applications respond really fast and be very powerful. We are living the time of big data, where you're talking about not only high volume data, you're talking about high frequency data as well. How do we really respond to it? I'll give you a couple of examples of the reactive applications. Hands down, the very first thing I will mention is Microsoft Excel. Probably the best application humans have ever created, isn't it? And is there any household that doesn't use Microsoft Excel one way or the other? But the beauty of Excel is you modify a cell, and before you could blink your eyes, all the cells that depend on it immediately changes. And in turn, all the cells that depend on that immediately changes, and this propagates recursively, that is reactiveness. But more than that, I discovered reactive programming in a, in a way that it really meant a lot to me. I travel almost 100%. I'm almost never home. My family quickly learned about digital communication and asynchronous communication. When my children ask me, Daddy, can I ask you a question? The answer is no. But Daddy, I've sent you a message. They'll get a response back from me. We learn about asynchrony very quickly. But my family and I maintain digital documents. That's the only way to stay connected. I'm almost all the, up to the time connected with what, what's going on in my family thanks to digital technology. So I know what my children are doing, what classes they are taking, what kind of input they need from me, thanks to my wonderful wife, she always keeps me up to date digitally. But then I discovered something which I never thought about. I was in a remote part of the world one morning, and when I woke up, I went on to Google Docs, and I noticed that my wife had updated the document, but more important, she was updating the document exactly at that moment. And immediately, I scrolled down to where she was actually typing back at home. And I put my cursor exactly where her cursor was. And I started changing the text that she was changing. With this, I found out you could be thousands of miles away and still find a way to annoy your spouse. 
To me, this is the best application of reactive programming. And for her to tell me, get out of my document now, was just precious. And then I discovered this is actually happening with people around the world. I work with people in different parts of this world, and we collaborate digitally. They update documents, I get notified, I update documents, they get notified. But more important, this is happening with millions of users exactly at the same time. That is big data right there, isn't it? And that's a really good example of very highly reactive application as well. So with that said, why do we need a different programming model? Because A, it's not different. It's a different way of thinking, but we really need to focus on it. But if you really think about it, let's ask the question, when, we, when it comes to these kinds of uh, activities, what have we been doing for the past about 20 years? I can summarize into an acronym, CRUD. We've been developing CRUD applications. So what do we do? We take the data from a database, we pass it to a process or a function, and then what do we do? We put it back into a database. If you really think about it, how do you explain your job to people? What do you do for a living? I take data and I put it back into the database. It's like, really? Why do you have to do this? Sorry, that's what they tell me to do at work, right? So we do this over and over and over. That's what we do. We take data and we put it back into the database. Now, at some point, you ask the question, is this what programming is about? Just keep getting the data and putting it back into the database. Well, it turns out the world we live in today is very different. We take the data and we pass it to a function, if you will. And then once we pass it to a function, that provides another data, which we then pass it to a data, pass it to a data, and pass it to a data. Now, what in the world are we doing here? We are doing what is called data flow computing. Now, here's a small story for you. You know, the, the room has wonderful people here. I, I love being in this field because there are people older than me, and there are people much younger than me as well. And there are some of you in this room, when I say back in the 90s, you look at me and say, what do you mean 80s and 90s, right? If they were not even born. Some of us were around during the 80s. My children always ask me, Daddy, what does it mean you were actually born when there was no Google, right? It's really hard for them to even think about it. But but back in the 80s, just like today, you know, I was sitting in Starbucks and having a cup of coffee, and people around me, all they were chanting was JavaScript, Node, microservices. I'm like, shut up. I want to focus on my work. But you can hear this chant in the background, microservices and, and you know, all these things they keep talking about. Similarly, back in the 80s, if you ever walk through the mall, in the background, you'll hear people chanting data flow, data flow, data flow. So data flow computing was very prevalent back in the 80s. What if I tell you I've got a great news for you? We can do data flow computing now. You look at me and say, Grandpa, sit down. We're not interested in it. So I will not tell you that we can do data flow computing. I'll tell you something else in the same, the same thing in a different word. Today you can do Amazon Lambdas and you can do serverless programming. You're like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. <clears throat> we can do data flow computing. Now, the beauty is we don't call it data flow computing because the old guys called it data flow computing. You want to give a new name for what everybody else did. This is the beauty of working in this field. You just sit there and say, so what are you calling it today? Right? That's the question we keep asking. Today, we call it serverless. We called it data flow back then. But I will emphasize one thing for you. What we have today is better than in the past, not in terms of technology. When I was a young kid, I could only read about data flow computing. If I wanted to do data flow computing, I had to be part of an elite group. I had to work in a large university or work in a really big corporation, neither one of which I had opportunity to. So all I could do was read about data flow computing and sit there and look through the window and think about this and say, my goodness, wouldn't it be so cool to actually do this? But today, my children have access to computing for a mere few cents, if you will. So what we are living is a beautiful time. I call it the uh, democratization uh, of computing. This is, to me, the biggest merit we can be joyful about. We are living the time of democratization of computing. A common person doesn't have to be associated with a large corporation or, or an organization or even a country. We could participate in that computing for only a few cents. 
I know we have not really reached everybody in this world, but definitely we have reached more people in the world than we did 20, 30 years ago. People like me couldn't get access to it, but my children can have access to it today. And that is what we are living today, beautiful days in this case. So we can do data flow computing, whatever name we call it. So what is reactive programming? I want to get to that. And I'm going to say two things about it. So reactive programming, first of all, is data flow computing. That is the very foremost thing that I want to emphasize is reactive programming is data flow computing. In that sense, if you really think about it, we'll come back and tie this to functional programming in a few minutes, what are the things we should really think about? So rather than thinking about the database, we're living the time of data streaming. We take a, data, a stream of data, and we think of data flowing through it, and we transform the data from one transformation to another transformation to another transformation, and what we do is these series of transformations. And that is what we are doing today is this reactive programming as in a series of data flow and data transformation. So to me, reactive programming is really data flow computing. But in terms of reactive programming, what are some of the pillars of this paradigm? Well, if you really think about it, what did we learn from object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming had four pillars of the paradigm. You had abstraction. You know, abstraction was not really new to object-oriented programming. People like Plato talked about abstraction centuries ago. So this is nothing new. What about encapsulation? Nothing new also, right? Because encapsulation is also nothing new because we have always had encapsulation before. Local variables are always encapsulated. This just takes the, the ideas further. What about inheritance? The only inheritance I know is inheriting pain. Not a very good feature. And lastly, of course, polymorphism. And it turns out that polymorphism is also really not new to object oriented programming. Four things brought together, nothing new in it. Same way, reactive programming also has four pillars of the paradigm. The very first thing is, how do we scale? Well, the question is, how many threads can I create on a machine? That's a really wrong question to ask. The real question is, how many threads should I create? It turns out the number of threads we can create is equal to, less than or equal to, the number of cores on the machine if our computation is really, uh, if our uh, work is really computation intensive. So that means if I have 70 million pieces of data to process, I cannot do that on a puny 256 cores machine. Or a thousand cores machine still is not enough. I got to scale horizontally. But the beauty of scaling horizontally is probably one of the merits we can look at the past 10 years to 11 years. 2007 was a very distinctive time in our history because we learned about elastic computing. So what does elastic computing say? I spent my youth as a system administrator. Uh, if you ever meet my wife, you can ask her about it. She will tell you how the days of my early days of my marriage was. I lit we literally slept in the office because I had to babysit all these computers and I had to keep them up and running all the time. When three o'clock it doesn't work, I got to jump off the bed and maintain it. I figured out it's much better to sleep in the office than try to do anything uh, remotely or run to the work in the middle of the night. I would never wish that on anybody even today. But the point really is, this is something we have done extremely well, isn't it? Because data flow computing has given us the ability to really, uh, uh, sorry, the elasticity has given us the ability to spin up servers when we need them based on the demand or time or both, and then when we're not using them, they go away. So the cloud computing is phenomenal, and reactive programming says, rely on elastic computing. The second is message-driven. Now, we want to communicate across these different processes. I was in a meeting talking to a client about microservice implementation. The conversation was going really well until one developer asked this very fateful question. He said, how do all these microservices talk to the central database? Everybody went quiet in the room. It's like somebody died. Nobody wants to talk anymore. That's a really sad thought to have, isn't it? Why? Because 
This is a slogan I want to use. I have some other recommendations in life. These are purely things I've learned in my life. I want to emphasize this. I'm going to say, uh, in life and in programming, you should never, I'll say we should never, uh, never share two things. I'm very particular about it. The first is toothbrush. The other is databases. So it's very important we never share these two. Occasionally, I may even be willing to share my toothbrush, but never databases. This is really a bad idea. So in life, we should never share these two things, keep them isolated. Well, the reason is, it really comes back to maintainability of things. We should never share it. So my mantra really is, uh, do not expose your database uh, instead export your data. So you want to really be able to export your data rather than expose your database. So this is one of the tenets when we're living now in the world of microservices and computing is you don't want to expose. I'm going to say having a centralized database and distributed transaction is so 20th century. It's one of the really bad things we did. File it under anti-patterns we have lived through in the past uh, century. So the point really is we want to be able to mess message pass, and of course, that's something we have really learned really well in the past few decades. We have really good technologies to pass messages again. Notice nothing new, it just brings things together. The third thing is responsiveness. So why is responsiveness extremely important? The application you quit using is the one that takes forever to respond. Excuse me. We live in the days of instant gratification. You're using this mobile application. It is slow. You don't even realize. You've moved on to use other applications. And somebody says, what did the application do? You're like, what application? Oh, yes. Oh, it still sucks. It's too slow. We're not going to use applications if they're not responsive. Imagine you walk into a store on a Saturday morning, and you see the clerk very busy helping another customer, what do you do? You maybe hang around for about five minutes, look at the ceiling, look at the floor, look at the shelves, and you quietly walk away. Why? Because there was no response. On the other hand, as soon as you walk in, the clerk looks at you and says, hey, I'll be with you shortly, and makes an eye contact with you, what did you do? You probably wait for 15 minutes. Why? Because you felt you were important even though you know you're not. And that's the wonderful thing about it is we have loyalty connected. Remember the day you discovered infinite scrolling? You went to this app, and suddenly this seems really fast. You're like, gosh, this is really fast. And you scroll down and your mind is saying, did you notice there's no bottom? When you scrolled it, there's empty space in there. And then before you could, so to say, react to it, it reacts to you and fills up the bottom with more data. And then as you scroll, it keeps on giving you more data. That's a really good example of being responsive. And the last thing I want to emphasize here is resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience is you will not be ever to build applications that never fail. But you want applications to fail gracefully, isn't it? The worst applications are the ones that disappear and force the users to enter all the data again. I call this the curse of a programmer. When I use an application, I always think about when it's going to fail. And, and that is one of the things we have to be very careful about. You want resilience of application. This, unfortunately, reminds me of another experience. I was speaking in a conference like this, and a gentleman came up to me and said, hey, Venkat, you probably don't remember this, but I took your distributed object computing course back in 1998, he said. I said, oh my goodness, I remember teaching that course in the 90s. I've been teaching at the university for about 30 years now. And he said, I took your class in the 1998. I said, I remember teaching those classes in the 90s. He said, I got a story to tell you. I said, oh, I love stories. Tell me your story. He said, well, I was in your distributed object computing course. And we had a project demo. Well, remember the, back in the 90s, we didn't have Wi-Fi. We had cables connected to our machines for uh, internet. Internet was about four years old. Of course, people will tell me that's not true. But for all practical purposes in the real world, common world, it was about four to five years old at that time. But we had a cable connected. And he was doing his demo for the course, and apparently, I walked up quietly to his machine, disconnected the internet cable, and I told him to continue. 
His project failed, the program crashed, and he said that he failed the course. I said, I'm really sorry, that's a tragedy. Why are you telling me this as a story? He said, because there's a good news, he said. I said, how could there be a good news once you have failed the story, or failed the course, where does it go? He said, because you taught me a very important lesson. You taught me not to program the happy path. And then he went on to say, now at work, when he codes, he doesn't just start with happy path, he programs resilience because in his office, in his cubicle, he said, on the wall, he has a picture of an evil venkat. And he looks at this picture every day when he codes. I don't know how this picture actually looks, by the way, but I don't think we need such a picture. We need to really program resilience that's extremely important. These are the four pillars of reactive programming, just like how object-oriented programming has four pillars, Reactive programming has four pillars as well. Having said that, now that we talked about what reactive programming is about, let's now relate to what this is really uh, you know, uh, tying to. But I'm gonna be a little narrow in my description here. So for my purpose, I'm gonna talk about Java 8 streams. I know Java 8 streams is not a full representation of functional programming, but we know that Java 8 stream provides the uh, so-called functional composition. It also provides lazy evaluation. There are symptoms of it, so I'll use that as a reference. Two reactive streams, and we'll talk about what the relationship between these two are. The first thing I want to tell you here is that Java 8 Streams has a functional pipeline. So similarly, a reactive stream also has a functional pipeline. So in that sense, the commonality is that you are pipelining them. Lazy evaluation is possible in Java 8 Stream, and so is lazy evaluation possible in reactive streams as well. Let's quickly take a look at one example here just to get a feel for it so that we can see what this really means in this context. So to understand this, let's just take one little example and play with it. I'm gonna use Rx Java, but you could use any implementation here, but I'm gonna go to Flowable right here, and I'm gonna call a create method in the Flowable. So it is gonna be integer, we'll call it a create method. It takes an emitter, and I'm gonna pass this emitter to a method called emit, which is gonna take the emitter right here. So this flowable comes from Rx Java. So what I wanna do now is to implement this method called the emit method, that's what I wanna implement. Let's implement the emit method. What am I going to do in the emit method? Don't worry too much about this for a minute. Let's go ahead and put the back pressure strategy here. We'll talk about this later on. But I'm gonna go back here and say output, we'll say starting, starting to emit. Now I go back to the code right here. And then I'm gonna say over here, uh, got the flowable, let's say. When I run the code, however, notice it says got the flowable, but it did not say starting to emit. Why not? Because it is lazy. It says I don't need to do any work. After all, you're not doing anything with it. Why should I waste my time doing anything with it? You can tease it a little bit. You can say, oh, really? I want to perform a map transformation. So map it to given a piece of data, simply return data times one to keep it very simple. It says, aha, I know what you're doing. You're still not using it. I won't budge. Then you say, all right, now let me go ahead and subscribe to this, and I'm gonna then take the data, and I'm gonna print out the data given to me. Now it says we got a deal. And notice it says starting to emit right now. So fundamentally what we just saw in this little example is that the reactive streams are actually supporting the two things from functional programming, and that is it supports the functional pipeline. It also supports, as we saw here, it also supports the lazy evaluation. So right at this point, I would simply throw in this. This is a realization I had. Reactive programming is functional, uh, functional uh, uh, so functional programming uh, plus plus. So this is my understanding. It called me silly, but I kind of stood up one day and I said, oh, I get this finally. It is not a disjoint idea. Reactive programming is actually functional programming taken to the next level. So it's a reactive programming is functional programming plus plus because you will see so many commonalities between these two as we're gonna see here. Well, in the case of streams, you are passing data. Well, in the case of a reactive stream, you pass data also. One more thing about these two, you put zero, one, or uh, more data. Similarly, in the case of a reactive stream, you pass zero, one, or more data. 
Unfortunately, the commonality ends right about there. And then reactive programming uh, takes up from here. And the next thing I want to talk about in this case is, what about error? So that's the question we need to ask, isn't it? What about error? Well, I can tell you how error is handled in stream using two English words. Those are called good luck. And essentially, you're out of luck at this point. Because what does the reactive uh, stream, uh, Java 8 stream say? Let me put it in blunt words what, is, what it says. Here's your pipeline. This is like you're driving on the freeway. You have a flat tire, and you're telling Java 8 stream, look, I had a flat tire, what should I do? And Java 8 stream says, blow up the freeway, right? It makes no sense to do this, isn't it? I'm gonna emphasize this as one thing we need to keep in mind, that is functional programming and exceptions are mutually exclusive. We don't do these two together. It makes zero sense to do exception handling when it comes to functional programming. Now the question is, what do you do about it? What do you do when there is an error? How do we handle it? You know, I always give analogies. I give examples from real life into programming. I never thought I would live the reverse. I lived an example from the class. I always gave this example when I talked about reactive programming, but this unfortunately happened to me in real life in January. In January, I was in Boston. I spoke at the Java user group right there. The next morning, 6.30, I have a flight to Montreal. Right across the border of the United States, I told myself, I'm an international traveler. I don't need to go to the airport really you know, early. I'm cool, I can handle it. So I get up at four, start driving to the airport. It had snowed the previous night, the road was filled with snow, and I was driving on the right side of the street when I heard a weird noise, a little thump. And within seconds, my car was not making much progress. I stopped my car, got out and looked at my front wheel, front right wheel, completely busted. So I'm sitting there at 4.15 in the morning with my flight to Montreal at 6.30, asking the question, what should I do? I got two hours and 15 minutes for the flight. What am I going to do? And so I immediately called the you know, towing service and said, hey, I, my car is stuck on the road. I got a flat tire. I need help. And they said, you're a valued customer to us. We'll be with you in two and a half hours. And I'm like, that's not going to happen because I want to go to Montreal because I'm going to give a talk that day. I don't want to disappoint developers over there. I want to be there. So I sat there, 4.15 in the morning, with nobody on the street asking the question, what would I do? And I immediately remembered what I teach in reactive programming, and that is deal with it downstream. I'm not kidding. I got back into the car, turned on the ignition, and put my foot to the floor, and I drove it all the way to the airport. You should have seen the face of these people in the airport when I drove in. Everybody stopped working and looked and said, what's up with you? Oh, just a flat tire. Oh, by the way, here's the key. This is the time when you're so happy it's a rental car. And I gave it to them, and I quietly walked away. Deal with it downstream. Two weeks later, I was in Europe. My wife called and said, hey, remember you told me about this? I said, yeah. Well, you got the bill from the credit card company, uh, from the rental car company. I said, sweetie, just wait for a minute. I sat down, drank a cup of water, and said, go for it. She said, they charge you $85. I'm like, yes, I can handle that. So the point really is, deal with it downstream. So in the case of reactive streams, it gives you what is called three channels. It gives you three channels. What are the channels it gives you? The first channel it gives you is called the data channel. The second channel it gives you is called the error channel. And the third channel it gives you is called completed channel. So the reactive stream has three channels for communication, the data channel, the error channel, and the complete channel. The complete channel is useful to tell you, I got no more data for you. The error channel is there to tell you something went wrong, here's an error. It is treating error as a data. So error is treated, uh, is, is treated um, uh, as a first class citizen. So if you really think about it, there's only one thing I think we're done really bad in our industry, calling exceptions as exceptions. 
We should have called it normal. Because stuff happens. Why call it exception and get excited about it when it does happen? So you treat errors as data, and you treat them as first class citizen. So when something goes wrong, you close the data channel, and the error goes through the error channel. Let's quickly take a look at this in a real quick example to see how this actually works. So back in this example, what I'm going to do, this is an extremely silly example just to illustrate the API. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say while count is less than 10, what I'm going to do here, it could be data, any data that you want to pass around. And what am I going to do now? I'm going to say emitter.onNext, and I'm going to pass the count after incrementing the count right here. And then I'm going to say emitter.onComplete, and I'm going to say I'm completed. So how does this work, really? Here is my data channel. So when I fire up this code and execute this code, you can see that the data came through the data channel, and I printed out the data. That's what you're seeing right here, is the data was emitted over here. It was received here on the site after transformation. Hey, what about the complete signal, though? I mentioned there are three channels. Here's the data channel. Then comes the next channel, which is the error channel. So in the error channel, I want to simply print out output. I'll say error in all uppercase, colon plus error. Then comes along the complete channel, and what I'm going to do in the complete channel is I'm going to simply take this uh, no data coming in and output done to say it is done. When I execute this code now, notice that it gave you all that output, and then it says done. You say, wait a minute, but what about the error, though? Well, to just illustrate the point, let's go back to this code and say, if count is equal to 7, then what am I going to do? Throw new runtime exception. So runtime exception, what kind of exception am I going to throw? We'll throw an exception we often see at work. Something went wrong, right? Uh, so we can see that something actually went wrong here, so we can deal with it. I love errors like this. Uh, something f I, I, this is my most favorite error message when I work with developers. They call me and say, it doesn't work. I will tell them, can we start with the word it? Then we'll move forward. What is it here, right? So this is frustration. Something doesn't work. Something went wrong. So execute this code. Let's see what happens. Notice it output those data. Notice it says error. And then it says something went wrong. So this is essentially transmitting the explosion right there. Notice in this code, this blew up. And when it blows up, what does it do? It says, no, 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 we don't do that in a civil world. It captures that exception and gives it to you as an error. I mean, think about this for a minute. How would you feel if I take things and throw at you right now? You're like, what's up with you, Venkat? Right? I mean, we could have disagreement. That's OK. But I can politely give you an error and say, here you go. And you're like, thank you. And we can still go out and have dinner together, isn't it? That's called being civil. But reactive programming is very civil. It doesn't throw things at each other. It simply says, here you go. I got a little error for you. Oh, thank you. Right? And you get that, and you process. It. So you can see that the three channels work really nicely, and we have a data channel, an error channel, and a complete channel. Great. Moving a little forward, a few other things. The stream API is sequential uh, versus it is parallel, right? That's how it's implemented in Java, at least. Well, the reactive stream is synchronous, uh, synchronous versus asynchronous. So this is something as a difference, again, between these two, if you will, synchronous versus asynchronous. That's another difference between those two. So we can see how that's, again, differing from, from this. So as a result, we can see that this is going to work through asynchrony, first of all. Secondly, no forking. What does that mean, no forking? When you have a stream, you are going to go through the stream from start to finish. You cannot do this. You cannot say, I'm getting the data. I'm going to fork one path and another path. That doesn't work in Java 8 stream. It's a single uh, stream, no forking. On the other hand, in the case of whereas here, you can actually have the ability to do uh, forking. So you can have multiple subscribers. And, and that behavior differs depending on what you do. And the last thing I will mention here is push at will. So you're going to be pushing data at your will. There is no uh, concept of uh, what, what we call as back pressure. 
whereas reactive streams provide back pressures for you. So to summarize what we talked about, this was a journey I went through. I started learning about reactive programming. And like everybody else, I was pretty confused about it. I was pretty uh, you know, agitated about it. And I started programming. And I almost went in a full circle. When I came back, I said, oh my gosh, reactive programming is not an isolated concept. It is a beautiful extension to functional programming. We have all the things in functional programming as common in the top, but then we are building on a higher level of abstraction. So my light bulb moment, my aha moment in my own mind was that reactive programming is functional programming plus plus. Hope that was useful. Thank you. Okay, so maybe um, some questions for Venkat for that? I'll be delighted to, yes, please. We have five minutes for that. No. Everybody's speechless, yes? Okay. You have a question? Please, please go ahead. So the question is, thank you for, for, thank you for the wonderful question. The question is, you talked about Java 8 streams, what about uh, Java 9? Uh, Java 9 has a flowable, and the, 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 the flow API. Essentially, what they did in Java 9 is something really smart. Java, uh, JDK, Oracle decided it's too late in the game to disrupt this world, so they beautifully collaborated with the reactive stream manifesto people and said, what we have done is really superb, we will take it as a standard API. So Java 9 has an API. I, I, I know this is a crude way to say it, but think about it like JDBC. It's an API with different implementations depending on the vendors. It's a very similar idea. So now Java 9, the reactive stream on the right side is actually part of Java 9 as a specification, but the implementations will be different depending on which implementer you want to use. So as a result, uh, it's a really good thing for us, the developers, because we can be using different uh, libraries and different uh, tools, but we can rely upon a standard way to program with it for most part, and then more important, communicate with it as well. Really good question. Thanks for asking that. Yes, please. Yes. You had a great example with the error channel. When you had some uh, numbers and uh, at the seven you throw some exception, and you gave it us politely. So could it be that uh, you could have some resilience and uh, work on this exception and just go on with the whole numbers? Yep. I see the other languages and Got other you. paradigms. Right. So, so, so let me just restate your question and make sure that I'm stating that correctly. So to summarize what you asked, hey, when an exception happens, it seems to be terminating at this point with an error. Uh, can't we just recover and move with more data coming through? Uh, so a couple of answers for that question. The first thing is, this idea is based on the concept of circuit breakers. So if something were to go wrong, you don't keep pushing more data. You give the opportunity for things to you know, uh, respond to it. So that's exactly what we do in circuit breakers. When something goes wrong, you wait for it to heal. So in this case, as you ask the question, what it's going to do is when something goes wrong, it is going to terminate it. However, having said that, if you really want to continue, uh, keep in mind that that data source is broken, but you can say on error resume next, and you can restart a uh, subscription. So so that there are uh, you know, opportunities available for doing that. Uh, th yeah, uh, that's really a good way to think about it. So, so you don't want to continue working with what's broken, but you can configure to uh, you know, move forward depending on your recovery. So there are other options to provide that for you as well. Thank you. One last question. One more. Oh. Yes, please. I, I, I can repeat your question. Go ahead, please. Uh, we have two questions, yes. Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, better uh, support in languages for reactive programming? Like uh, Java, Java has the API and Java 9 has a flow API, but it doesn't have a s specific operations, and especially in terms of handling exceptions or, or debugging. So if you, for example, don't catch an exception, it doesn't get propagated. In synchronous code, it gets propagated out of the method. 
So you're talking about a streams API or the reactive streams in this case? Uh, both, but oh, you're more greedy. Reactive, you want reactive, both. <laughs> yeah, but it applies to both. But uh, more, I'm more interested in reactive. Uh, right. API. So, 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 so the honest answer is I, I don't know, and I, I'll tell you why I don't know. Um, I'm really torn between two things. On one hand, I want more support in the languages. On the other hand, I don't want the languages to become big also. Uh, I'm, I'm a person who really enjoys languages. And I begin to dislike languages when the languages become overly powerful and, and too big. So, so in a way, you want the language to have minimalistic features and you want to be able to do more things in the library. So that's why I'm saying I don't know, because it's a conflict I have to walk every single day. On one hand, I want this. On the other hand, I don't want to, this to go overboard. So, so I don't know of a good balance between those two. And, and my fear always is that maybe they'll go overboard with it. That, that's my concern. So, so I don't know, uh, you know if I can clearly say, because that's a conflict I have to deal with every day in my own mind. Yeah. One last question. Please. Looking into that one, I was actually wondering what are the patterns to automate test this one? Uh, so the question is what are the uh, ways to automate the test? A really important uh, topic to think about. Well, uh, the, good, the short answer is uh, different libraries give you uh, different uh, tools already to do that. That's really the good news. Uh, they give you ability to mark away certain things. If you want to really think about it, think about it as a pipeline you are drawing. And, and what you pass to the pipeline, there are things you want to really look for, meaning, hey, did I receive this message over here? Uh, is the transformation happening the way I expected? And a lot of times, you don't want to rely upon a, a real data because that becomes really brittle and, and expensive to test it. So the short answer is a lot of the libraries that we use give you uh, tools to mark and stub these things. That's what, that would be a really good starting point. Uh, the second answer is, if you really look at the uh, transformation, the methods you pass into the lambdas, one of the rules I personally follow is that I would never let the lambdas be multi-line. I, I always discourage people from putting a curly braces. That's really a bad idea. So what you want to really do is, if this is a little bit more complex, write that as a separate method, use a method reference, and unit test that method separately. So you can unit test those methods separately, and then you can use uh, stubs and marks these tools provide for you to start automate the test of the reactive libraries that you're using. Uh, so the good news is it's very doable. Uh, the bad news is it requires discipline, which op often is in short supply in our industry. But, but I think if we're putting our mind to it, we can definitely do it really well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you, Venkat.